Hey everyone, welcome to Beyond. Thanks for uh, tuning in and be sure to hit like and subscribe so the algorithm can find this show for others. And today I have a very special guest who wants to talk about an upcoming book called Unlocking Your Superpower, Eight Steps to Turn Your Existing Knowledge into Income. Noted entrepreneur, lawyer, and university dean, Ellie Sheffy, uh, offers eight steps to turn your existing knowledge into income as we described. And Ellie has created a must-have playbook for launching your business using free resources. Ellie, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. You know, I had a chance to read your, uh, your backstory, your biography, and uh, it's very inspirational to see where you start off and where you're at today. So if you could take the audience back to where it all started for you, or all got started for you. Well, I am born and raised in Southern California. Um, I grew up without a lot of resources. My parents worked really hard, but my, when I was little, my dad was a forklift mechanic. My mom was a public school teacher. Um, so they worked really hard to make ends meet, but that meant that there wasn't any extra for, you know, clothes and shoes and, you know, activities and, and a lot of that kind of thing. So from a young age, uh, I've been working multiple jobs since I was 10 and um, really going back to that young age um, to learn how to be resourceful. So no matter what came my way, I've had a, a ton of obstacles throughout life. But that early training of how to be resourceful has been paramount to get me through everything that's ever happened. And it's actually going back to that training on being resourceful that I was able to draw on to write the book. Yeah, that's amazing. I saw this incredible story this past weekend of a boy that came from Cuba and he was about eight years old and he was in abject poverty. When you come over from Cuba, generally the Cuban uh, community in South Florida will take you in for a period of time until you can get in your feet and get that job and get established. And um, he was talking at eight years old. He kind of experienced poverty that you and I would look at as, as very extreme. And around 10, he came across one of his friends who was actually eating lunch, which was shocking to him because in his time, his food basically rations were an egg in the morning and rice and beans at night. And that was it. And he came across his friend that had this amazing lunch. He goes, well, how'd you get that lunch? He goes, well, you know, food stamps. So the, the boy explained to him what food stamps were all about. And then he went back to his dad. He says, hey, dad, have you ever heard about this thing called food stamps? His dad said, well, of course I have. Well, well dad, why aren't we taking advantage of food stamps? And he goes, well, that's for the poor. And so this boy's thinking like, oh, my God, if that's for the poor, you know, I'd hate to see where we're at currently because it feels like we don't have a lot. And then his dad looked at him and he says, um, he says, you know, it's for the poor. He goes, but it may be for the poor. Um, and the only difference is we just don't have money, meaning we're not poor. We're not poor in spirit. We're not poor in ability. We just don't happen to have money. And when I heard that and I listened to what you just described, you know, to 10, year, 10 years of age for yourself, you saw the need and the opportunity to work and really apply yourself. And you really haven't stopped since. And and I think that's, that's quite amazing. So as we look at your, your journey, as I read your biography, we know it's not easy. You know, for anybody in this world, you know, maybe there's some people with silver spoons in their mouth, right? But we know life can be anything but easy. And I hear a lot of talk about privilege, right? Um, but what I've seen in your history and your story is tenacity, determination, uh, when the chips are down. So what are some of the challenges that you navigated growing up? Well, um, once I got on my own, uh, I was homeless. I lived in my car. I wanted to go to college and didn't have money to go to college. And like I said, I was living in my car. So again, I called on being resourceful. Okay, if I want money and I don't have any and I don't have a place to stay, what do I know? What do I love? What can I do to get me a place to stay, to get me money? and to move the needle so I can go to college. And from there, because by that point, you know, at 19, 20, I've been working for 10 years already. So at, at that point, I thought, oh, well, I know how to teach and train. I've been doing it for a decade. I'll open a management training center. And I'll, I'll, I'll put the ads in, in the newspaper because, you know, back then it was classifieds and I will answer the phone myself and I'll get one of those little one room executive offices and I'll live in there and, um, and I'll just talk to people. I'll interview, I'll teach, I'll train, and then I'll farm them out to other businesses that need managers or receptionists or inventory help. And that's what I did. 
So, you know, even back then, knowing that I could use what I know, do, and love to be resourceful, to not only help myself, but help other people, I built that business. Um, and that is how I was then able to go to college and get an apartment and get the ball rolling. Um, no, so I've got to ask this. I mean, your, your, your energy is effervescent. Um, it, it's electric at some levels. And so how did you avoid going in that rabbit hole of despair? I mean, you talked about being homeless, living out of your car at 19. A lot of people, especially uh, the current generations of people have had it very easy. We just go just down that rabbit hole, despair, depression, and anxiety. What was it about you that gave you that perspective? To be able to look at that dire circumstance of being homeless, living in your car, to be able to have the mind and wherewithal to go to go create that strategy and pursue that opportunity. I have actually been, I don't even remember how I, I initially, that very first nugget got exposed to him. But I have been studying Tony Robbins and the whole personal development and mindset uh, sphere since I was 10. Since those early that early age, I remember listening and hearing, listen and associate yourself with successful people and you too will become successful. I remember hearing change your story, change your life. I remember hearing uh, you control your thoughts and your thoughts control your feelings, your feelings control your actions, your actions control results. So once you learn to master your mind, you can learn to master your outcome. Uh, I remember learning the power of goal setting. Um, Tony Robbins used to say, make a goal for your day, make a goal for your week, make a goal for the month, make a goal for the quarter, make a goal for six months, make a goal for the year. And even as that middle school child, I actually had notebook paper taped to my wall where I would write my little goals. And, you know, back then it was, it was see – Michael Jackson in concert. It was see Janet Jackson in concert. It was by this particular cassette tape. I mean, it was, it was things like that. It was go see this movie. But what it did is it got me in the habit of goal setting. And then it got me in the habit of the power of actually taking the pen. And when I saw that movie that was on my list, crossing it off the goal list, physically crossing it off the paper on the wall, and then adding a new goal to the bottom of the, of the list. So it trained me to focus on progress. It trained me on the power of incremental goal setting. It trained me on the power of focusing on the achievement of your goal. And it also trained me on the power of Every time you meet a goal, you set a new one. It is a constant journey. You don't just, you celebrate your win, but you don't just rest on your laurel and say, okay, you know, I'm done. It's that constant progress. So from those lessons that I learned, you know, 35, 36 years ago, I still apply them. I still have goals. I still physically write them down and cross them off. And every time I cross them off, I think, okay, what, what's next? Um, I focus on a culture of progress, constantly moving the needle. What can I do in this moment to move the needle to attain my goals? Not, not what can I do this month that can get overwhelming, life happens. But what can I do right here and now that I can control that's going to move the needle? So what that does is it always allows me to stay in control of my mindset and it allows me to, con to stay in control of my journey no matter what's going on in the, in the outside world. Yeah, it feels like a sense of progression every day. So it sounds like from the earliest of stages and ages, um, you're, you're getting a PhD in life sort of management, um, yep. life thought process, and, and you obviously had some great mentors in, in Tony Robbins for sure. Um, so as you transition, again, I'm very impressed with the fact that 19, you're homeless, out of a car, yet you're using these tools not to get better, but to get better, um, to really man manage and create the right perspective. So what led you, and obviously you want to go to college, what led you to the ultimate career choice of becoming an attorney? From the time I was three, if you asked me what I wanted to be, I would have told you I want to be a United States Supreme Court Justice. It is literally all I have ever wanted to do uh, from childhood. And as I grew up, 
I realized kind of what all that entails and how political it is to get there and, and, you know, the real world journey of kind of what it takes to even be a fish in the pond of consideration. And that didn't really align with who I am at my core and the core principles that I hold dear and that I live by. Um, and so instead I thought, okay, well, I'll be an attorney and I'll be the staff attorney to a federal judge. And um, as, as a career law clerk, I help the judge evaluate the evidence. I help the judge evaluate the law and I am an advisor to the judge. And so that was my way of getting to still be in that sphere, to still do that work of upholding the law, of, of fighting for justice, of making sure that every single case that is before the judge, those parties are seen, they are heard, their evidence is considered, that somebody actually pays attention and somebody actually cares about what they're arguing, about what their situation is, and can um, neutrally just apply the facts to the law. This is the evidence you've given me. This is what the law requires. If you've given me the evidence that matches what the law requires, then we can rule in your favor. Then we can't. And right. so I've done that for uh, almost, almost 20 years now. And I, I still do it. I love it. It's a passion of mine. Um, can you share some of the more interesting cases you've come across, if you're allowed to? Uh, well, I, I can't go into, you know, uh, a lot of detail, but I will just say that the bulk of what I do uh, in the federal arena is going to be things like uh, discrimination. So Title VII, uh, any form of discrimination comes, is a federal claim, so that will come before the federal court. And um, that also spans Title IX, which is obviously your discrimination in, uh, kind of in education. Um, and of course, I do all of the constitutional claims. So your First Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment, Eighth Amendment, uh, that kind of thing. And I, I also do all of the prison condition uh, and civil rights actions. So that's the bulk of what I do in the federal arena. Of course, with the mortgage crisis, you know, we get a lot of mortgage cases. Um, there's always diversity cases where the two companies or, you know, from different states. Uh, but the bulk of what I personally focus on are going to be the constitutional rights, the civil rights. And that is my passion. And I'm blessed to be able to get to do that. That's exciting. So you, you're not to not to be outdone. And clearly, you're you're really an underachiever here, because you're also in addition to that, uh, Dean of the School of Law at California Southern University, uh, criminology and criminal justice. Um, how do you ensure that as students come into the university that the coursework remains relevant? Because it seems like the law is so fast changing and obviously with everything going on in the United States today, um, how do you ensure as the dean of that school that what students are getting um, is relevant and stays relevant? That is at the forefront of my mind always, especially helming two different schools that have similar but sometimes competing interests, right? Uh, the School of Law upholds the law. It's very important to me that it does stay relevant, that we stay current. Um, because of that, all of my faculty mentors are active practicing attorneys. Uh, I want them to be out there, frontline, in the field, uh, dealing in real time with their cases, with their clients. So. Uh, that's one way that I ensure. I also have an amazing advisory council of other practicing attorneys who are not part of the university, but who are experts in their field, uh, who also bring a wealth of, of expertise, not only in their subject matter areas, but they are also uh, either current or former prof uh, law professors at other institutions as well. So between all of us, um, we're able to really make sure that the curriculum stays relevant, that the coursework and the activities stay relevant. Um, it does help that I still practice, right? That I'm still involved with the federal judiciary because I'm seeing the cases that are coming through all the time. 
I see what gets filed. So, and I see how the courts are ruling, how the judges are ruling, and kind of how the law is shaping up. Obviously, this particular term uh, with the Supreme Court uh, is definitely going to impact the law. Uh, well, obviously, it's the Supreme Court, but they they had some really key uh, decisions come down this term. So that'll be interesting to see how that develops. And obviously, with the current climate of uh, things that are going on right now, that will have a ripple effect. There will be revisions in the law um, in a wide area of law. I mean, not just civil rights or constitutional rights, but now that the world is uh, heavily working remotely, now that you know most companies in the US have at least gone remote to some degree because of quarantine and COVID, and you know now we're having another wave, um, I, I think we're going to see reform in workers' compensation law, in employee ERISA law, employee benefits, in insurance law. I mean, I think there's going to be a trickle-down effect that we're really going to see. Um, so that will be very interesting. And then, of course, being the dean of criminology and criminal justice, almost all of my learners are frontline current law enforcement officers. Uh, my advisory board for criminology and criminal justice are 100% police chiefs. And all of my criminology faculty are either active practicing attorneys, if they're teaching the law courses that the criminology learners take, um, or they are active police sergeants and, and uh, that kind of thing. So it's you know, they're on the front line right now and they're dealing not only with frontline COVID, but with protests and um, unrest. And they're dealing with, uh, a, I think a really pivotal time in history for what it means to be a law enforcement officer. So it's it's been, um, I'm sensitive to both sides. I'm sensitive to all of my learners. I have checked in with all of them my learners, my mentors, and my advisory council. I'm here for them. And um, it, it'll be interesting to see kind of the changes in both schools and in both professions. Yeah, it's going to be dynamic, and it's certainly a dynamic time. And, and so, you know, big question that people have, whether it be the Supreme Court or other um, judges, is you can legislate from the bench or just interpret the law as written. Um, how, how do judges strike that balance? I mean, because I know there's case law, and typically if you go through divorce court, they don't make up the laws you're in there with your case. They look at case law and precedent, um, and then they rule based on that. Now, certainly I found judges are subjective on a given day. If they're having a good day or a bad day, you know, there's that. And, and, and rulings can come down accordingly. But how does a judge strike a balance between trying to legislate from the bench versus I'm just interpreting the law as written? Well, unless you're the Supreme Court, <laughs> You should not be legislating from the bench, period. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but that is not your job. Um, it is your job as, a, as an officer of the court, it is your job as a judge to uphold the law. Judges are not supposed to be activists. Happens all the time, I'm not saying it doesn't, but they are not the legislature and they are not the Supreme Court. We have separation of powers. We have delineation of responsibilities. We have a hierarchy for a reason. And the only people that should be making law <laughs> are the legislature of either the state or uh, the United States or the Supreme Court. It is not the purview of lower court judges to make law. Just, yeah, and I hope I hope a lot of Americans feel that way because I think that's really really important. So, in all this change and all this dynamic, have you seen an uptick in the interest in criminal law within your university? In terms, of, in other words, more people enrolling to get involved in this space in this area? Uh, not yet. Well, it'll be interesting to see. I think at the moment, people are still uh, the people who would be interested in that. Um, whose curiosity has been sparked, whose passion has been ignited. I think they're still out there on the front lines. Uh, we are still having uh, protests. We are still having um, people who are actively trying to get bills together or lobby, uh, that kind of thing. So I think the, the spark that's been ignited is still focused there. Um, 
maybe in time as as the thought goes more to more from what what can I do right now to how can I use my voice in the long term I think that's when that shift happens that's when we'll start to see uh, more learners go huh or, or more people go maybe I want to go into law enforcement or maybe I want to go into law and and pursue becoming an attorney so that I can affect change from that platform yeah no absolutely and I hope you know I hope with law enforcement I think they've gotten a, they've taken a big hit a big mm -hmm. shot and I think a couple things need to happen I think they need to mandate at a minimum a college degree and at a minimum X number of hours a year just like Navy SEALs get trained like they'll do um, they'll do like 18 months for a six-month mission for example of intense training so I think there has to be some level of education right and training that goes with that profession um, and, I, and I hope that this this sort of thing we've gone through and we're going through um, provide some reform in that area because I think they're they're vital. They are the thin blue line of yeah. civilization, civilized society. So, um, you know, fingers crossed. So, I want to sort of pivot to this amazing book you you've written and your new book, Unlocking Your Superpower: Eight Steps to Turn Your Existing Knowledge into Income. I mean, who doesn't want to turn their ideas and what they know into income? I think everybody in the audience would love to do that. But it teaches budding business moguls how to establish a brand, gain visibility, generate income, and create staying power. So. How did you, how did your experience as an entrepreneur influence this book? I called on it. So the, the whole book came about because of COVID. So I've been an entrepreneur, like I said, for 35 years and I've had multiple businesses. I've started them all literally from nothing based on what I know, do and love. Huh? How can I be resourceful? What do I know? How do I find what a market need is? How do I bridge that gap? How do I use what I know, do, and love to, to meet a market need and then get it out to market? So I've done it time and time again. I do it right now. I, you know, I'm the staff attorney to a federal judge. I'm the dean at, uh, of the School of Law and the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice, but I still have my own companies as well. So I am always looking for what do I know, do, and love? What does the market need? How do I bridge that gap? How do I make that happen? And then COVID hit. And I have so many friends who are entrepreneurs uh, who had thriving businesses, A, or B, they had a job, they lost their job. People aren't in their industry aren't necessarily hiring or they were having a difficult time finding a job and they live alone. So they're the sole breadwinner. How are they gonna pay the bills? So uh, I'm really passionate about helping people. It's the, the thread uh, through everything I do. Every single thing I do is about empowering people with practical tools and implementable action plans and helping people build the life that, that they dictate, that they create, that they desire. Um, so that's across the board. And when I started seeing my friends lose their jobs and lose their businesses, I was like, oh no, not on my watch. <laughs> so we did a Zoom call and I gathered them on the Zoom call and I was like, all right, let's see. What do you know? What do you do? What do you love? Let's come up with some pivot plans for those of you that have a business that are losing it. How can we pivot? How can we diversify? Um, how can we create partnerships and affiliations? Uh, how can we do a referral network? How can you uh, maintain your existing client base? How can you grow that client base so that when we emerge from this pandemic, you still have a client base that's now larger that you can use to, to jumpstart and carry on? And so after about three hours, each of them had a pivot plan and an action plan. And their feedback was like, this is this is life changing. This is amazing. This is a godsend. You need to write a book. Like you have to be able to get this kind of structure to all the people out there that really need help because they've just lost their jobs or lost their businesses. And you know that Cal Southern, our learners are a bit older. So I know from learners reaching out that so many of them were finding themselves in the same situation as my friends. They're losing their jobs, they're losing their businesses, they've got a family to, pro to provide for, um, they're still trying to get their education, what are they gonna do? 
So I sat down and I poured my heart and soul into everything I've learned from 35 years of doing it time and time again and changing markets and in various uh, arenas and industries and I wrote the book and it literally walks you step by step by step and it's practical it's implementable it's make a list of this go to Facebook and search this join this do that um, so it's it's literally if you take the book and you open it and you just do what it says <laughs> By the end of the book, if you've been implementing along the way, you will have the basis of a business. You will have the basis of a brand. You'll be able to get your brand and your message and your offerings out into the marketplace. So I, I stripped it down, made it as, you know, A, B, C, one, two, three as possible. Um, and I'm super excited. Uh, the feedback from people who have pre-ordered it has been phenomenal. And they've, in fact, asked for more resources. So now I've developed uh, an e-course and we're doing a workshop series for people that want more interaction with me. Um, we've got a coaching program for people that want one-on-one -on -one or small group, like personal. This is my particular situation. This is my particular business. Um, and so it's, it's amazing. Like I just am so excited and so honored to be able to help people with a lifeline and, and to help yeah. people, you know, be able to provide for themselves and their families. Yeah, that's important. I think practical roadmaps are always more valuable than highbrow, theoretical, uh, enigmas wrapped in a mystery concepts, right? Where people yeah. are like, I sort of get what you're saying, but I'm not sure how to apply it, right? Yeah, because, yeah. You know, so they that, don't have time really for that right now, right? This is, this is a pandemic. They have lost their jobs. They have lost their businesses. They do not have time for rah-rah. They do not have time for theory. They're like, tell me something that I can implement while we're on the train, while we're on the call. What can we do? Let me do that because time is of the essence. I need to feed my kids. Right. So let, let me stop a second here and sort of, um, I was able to get uh, the table of contents for the books. And I'd just like to, uh, you know, high level touch on each chapter if we may. Yeah, sure. Um, I know that and we'll talk about when the book's going to become available. But in chapter one, um, it starts off with identifying your superpowers. So just at a high level, what does that mean exactly? That means let's walk through figuring out what you know, what you do, and what you love. And then let's figure out where the overlaps are. Because yes, you can build a, a thriving business just on what you know, or just on what you do, or just on what you love. But when you can find the overlaps and the intersections of those things, you're more powerfully poised to exceptionally deliver results to your clients. Right, so then I walk you through, once we've identified what you know, and what, uh, what you do, and what you love, your knowledge, your skills, and your passions, and we've started then to identify the areas of overlap, not only do we look for the areas of two intersections, but I have a, a little Venn diagram that I have everyone complete, and the intersection in the middle, anything that you have that your knowledge, skills, and passions overlap, all three overlap, that's where we're going to start. Yeah. And it's, it, it has a better chance of being successful, right? So then as we sort of pivot to chapter number two, identifying the problem you want to solve, this sort of resonated with me um, in medical devices, which I've been involved in since like 92. Um, when you're bringing a, a product to market or a device to market in this case, um, some of the mistakes that are typically made is they'll come up with a really creative idea or a product. Then they look for the niche it's going to, it's going to sort of fit into or the problem it's going to solve. And, and the best way to sort of bring a product <laughs> to market is identifying the unmet need, the unfit, you know, unmet medical device need or whatever it may be, the gap in the market. Uh, and then you start to create the value around that need. So I found it interesting that you said chapter number two, identifying the problems you want to solve. What did you mean exactly by that? Well, people will pay for products and services that solve a problem, that alleviate a frustration, that meets a need that they have or that makes their life uh, better, faster, easier, more efficient, more convenient. So when you know what your superpower is, you know what you know, do, and love, you know what the intersection is, you know then, oh, if I do this particular thing, I am powerfully poised to serve my clients. And then you see, well, what does the market need? Then you're able to, once you start seeing like, all right, 
what are the, what are my friends? What are the people in my sphere? What are the people in my neighborhood? What are the people in my community? What are the people in my industry? Um, what are they complaining about? <laughs> Start there. I mean, I, I walk you through as a basic of a thing as what do you complain about? What do your friends complain about? What do the people in your neighborhood complain about? What do the people on your social media complain about? Whatever they're complaining about, whatever they're saying they wish they had or something they don't like or uh, a problem that they're identifying, those are people you already know. So they're already in your sphere and they're serving up to you something on a silver platter, an array of things on a silver platter of, of, of things that they're begging for a solution for or begging for a product or service that will address. So chapter two is really about being able to identify those things so that at the end of chapter two, you can marry them up and you can look at your superpower and say, all right, well, I can really powerfully serve in this area. And then you look at everything that you've identified as a frustration, a, a problem, a something people have been asking for, they're complaining about, and you see, huh, which one of all of these things that people are complaining about can I use my superpower to address? And now you know, huh, you have the problem that you can solve and you know that you personally can be the person that can solve it. You know, a small example of that is I know when COVID hit, I saw all these um, ladies and their businesses creating masks, very mm -hmm. creative, ornate masks for their customer base, whether it be a restaurant or a lash artist or fill in the blank. It was kind of, it was kind of curious but also very interesting where they saw the need and all of a sudden they had the pivot. Maybe they saw it on Pinterest or some other place, um, but they put their sort of collective powers together and created these really cool, cool masks. Yeah. And they were ahead of the trend, right? Because now you can go anywhere and get it, but their clients already have them and their clients have bought them from them. And so now that their clients have already bought one from them, now that masks are being required, they're going to go back and get more masks. Right. And if they like them, now they're going to get those masks from that friend for their kids, for their neighbors, for, you know, as, as gifts for people that have helped them out. It's All those funny. people so, are now going back to, to those ladies that, yeah. that identified, they knew they were good at sewing, they knew this was something they could do, and they saw the need and they met it. So here's what's interesting. It kind of goes now to the next question, which is chapter three which is identifying your sphere of influence. I think a lot of people oftentimes think like, who am I really influencing? I'm just me. I may have a social media profile on Facebook or Twitter. And unless you're a big name with millions of followers, it's easy to say, well, who do I really influence? But in this case with these ladies that were creating masks, um, innately they knew that if they put it out there, there's a lot of people, you know, just down the stream, right? Of people to people to people. That'd be interesting. So, so sort of walk us through the sphere of influence. And for those people that say, do I really have a sphere? What would you yes. say to them? <laughs> yes, you do. You absolutely have a sphere of influence. So I walk you through first, before we even get into who you know, I walk you through the importance of developing your ideal client avatar. Because before you can find them, you have to know who you're looking for. So once you know what your superpower is, and you know the problem that you want to solve. Now it's who has that problem. Let's break it down into their characteristics. Where do they hang out? What do they value? Uh, what, um, what activities do they do? You really break down what makes them happy, what makes them sad, what are their pleasure points, their pain points, what are their dreams, their desires. You're breaking down your ideal client avatar who, who your perfect person would be that would have this problem that you're going to address. And it's critical to start there because once you have a clear client avatar, then you can find them because you know what their hobbies are, you know what their interests are, you know where they're hanging out because you've already thought through that. So then you can put yourself in a proximity of where they are and I walk you through step by step all the little tricks I have for being able to do that. It's one of my favorite parts of, of the book and, and the course and the workshops that we do is really being able to uh, help you open up this whole universe of people that you didn't even realize you have. So that's one of my favorite tricks. Uh, but you need to know 
who you're, who you want to serve so that you can find them. And also so that you'll be able to develop your brand and also develop your messaging. Because in order to connect with your ideal clients, you need to be able to speak their language. You yeah, need it's, to like, it's not like I'm going to go sell a Tesla to an age of two to eight years old, right? Or two exactly. To it's, I, yeah. I don't know the market I'm going after, right? And so right. then chapter number four, I think is really critical, which is creating the brand. And we can think about, you know, Nike or, or Apple or Tesla and the logos that created a brand and, you know, sort of an experience. And in one of the first parts of that chapter, you said, identify the why. And I just want to say that the why is critical. Um, the what and the how. The why is really at the center. If you think about Apple, think different. When people sort of branded themselves mentally and emotionally to Apple, that was the why. What yep. you're going to get is a company that thinks differently. This is why we do what we do. The how and what we do, eh, not so much, but the why is really important. And what I love about where you're kind of going through this progression is if I'm first starting out and I've lost my job, what's the number one thing I'm really lacking? If I lose my job or I got fired or something really uh, bad happened, I would argue that most people have lost their confidence, right? They're kind of way. And you've developed this beautiful roadmap um, to sort of go through these steps of, um, sort of a, a roadmap, a blueprint of how you can get there. So, so vitally important. So sort of dive, uh, take a little deeper dive into creating a brand. And what does that mean to you? Well, like you said, I start with identify the why. The why for me has several different components. Number one, you need to identify why you want to solve this problem. Why is it important to you? What is your why? Because building a business can be a little challenging. You know, it, it's not just you snap your fingers and it happens. There's a step-by-step -step process. It's completely attainable. It's completely doable. But your why is going to be your fuel and it's going to be your anchor. So your why, when you are clear on why, you're, why this is important to you, why you want to do it, why you want to solve this particular problem, well, why these are the people that you care about serving. When you're clear on that, that gives you that passion, that gives you the fuel, it gives you the drive to keep going. Uh, it's also important to identify the why of the client, right? So now that you're clear on who the ideal client avatar, to your point, why does your client care about this problem? Why is your solution going to help the client? Why is your solution going to resonate with the client? Why would you resonate with the client? Why would the client connect to you and choose you to be the person to deliver the solution? So with creating your brand, we really start with the why because it's just critical. Um, once you have clarity on all the different aspects of your why, and you've got clarity on your ideal client avatar, and you've got uh, clarity on the problem you wanna solve, and you have clarity on your superpowers, you can start to develop your brand voice and your brand vision and your brand statement. Um, Nike, just do it. Apple, think differently. What do you want your brand to be known for? And so I walk you through step-by-step step how to figure that out, how to create that, um, and then how to get that brand so that it's resonating directly with your ideal client. It's speaking directly in the language of your ideal client to the pain points of your ideal client in a way that resonates with your ideal client and in a way that your ideal client will connect emotionally with your brand and with you. That's really important. And so chapter five is really maxim or connecting with your tribe and maximizing your network. So before you sort of jump into that chapter, how important is it for people in their social media to be thoughtful about their politics? You know, because you see in social media, people look at it as a, uh, a place to air grievances or maybe it's a good uh, therapeutic moment in session. Um, but how important is it for people to be thoughtful about where they position thing, them, th themselves in the political spectrum? Not that they shouldn't have their beliefs, but if you're trying to build a business and connect with people and ultimately customers, um, how should people think about that? I think it just, there's two, two main avenues for that. I know a lot of people will say, well, on my personal page, I'm going to do whatever I want because it's my personal page and I'll have a separate uh, company page, business page, brand page, and that's completely valid. What I will say, though, is a lot of your clients are going to come, at least initially, 
and a lot of your network at least is going to come initially from people that you already know. So you just want to, I mean, it, it's a balance and I would never dictate or really advise people on that, but I would just say your ideal client will connect with your brand and your brand is an extension of you. So keep that in mind. And I, I would think it, it also kind of depends on the, the niche that you're serving, right? The problem that you're solving, who your ideal client is. We all have different ideal clients. If your ideal client is somebody who is very passionate about their beliefs and, and their political views, then maybe it serves you to follow the same <laughs> views. Right. Like, yeah. So you just really want to have that clarity. And that's why we don't start with brand. That's why we don't start with network. That's why I'm very intentional about the order of the chapters and the order of the course and the, the exercises we do in the workshop. It's very, very intentional on how do we build and how do we build in a progression that is giving you the clarity that you need so that when you get to building a brand and then when you get to maximizing your network and, and gaining visibility and those kind of things, you have clarity on all the key components that are going to guide the decisions that you make when you're creating a brand statement, when you're creating a brand identity, when you're having your logo or your tagline, all of that comes because you have the clarity before that and so that you can make a consistent brand that is going to speak to the audience who has the problem that you're solving. Right. So in chapter six, you talk about gaining visibility and engagement. I'm sure for everybody on social media, they would love to have that high class problem. So how do you maximize your message and how do you um, grow the following on a social media platform? What are some strategies people can think about? Um, this is my other favorite section of the book. I love, 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 love my little tips and tricks for free ways to gain visibility. Um, I'm going to keep my favorite one as a surprise. You got to get the book for it, but <laughs> cause I, 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 it's just genius and it's my favorite. Um, but I will say that my other favorites that are, are really, really, really effective, um, are going to be things like partnering, co-branding of creating an affiliate ar army, creating referral bonuses, and harnessing the power of client reviews. A lot of people forget about the power of client reviews, but um, getting client reviews, good client reviews, is an amazing way to boost your visibility and your engagement. Because who doesn't search for reviews when you're, when you're wanting to hire somebody or buy something? We all look for reviews. So I do walk you through how to create win-win partnerships, how to find and connect with potential partners, um, a good, how to think through what are some things that your particular clients would buy before, during, or after your product or service. Um, those are great places to partner or affiliate uh, to get a cut of what they're going to buy before or after you. Um, and it's a great way for your partner, whoever you're, you're affiliating with or partnering with, to get a cut of what people are doing when they're with you. Right. So finding that kind of spectrum um, is a, a, a really great way to be able to maximize your visibility, grow your audience free, doesn't cost you anything, and in fact, it's a revenue generator. Uh, same thing with uh, creating affiliate armies. Uh, it's super easy on ClickBanks and a, you know, a ton of other uh, resources that are out there to incentivize people to help you. Give them 50%, give them 30%, give them 25%. Um, incentivize them to go out there and spread the word to their audiences for you. Then it doesn't cost you anything. It's a free way that you're reaching all of these other people that didn't know about you, wouldn't have known about you had that affiliate not gone out and promoted your product or your service. Yeah, that's a genius idea. So obviously you can have a massive, huge social media following. And then the next question is, how do you monetize it? How do you monetize your superpower as you have in chapter seven? And I think that's really the crux. You can have a lot of people following and how do you get stick, uh, you know, stiction or trackiness with your, your product or offering? So 
how, how, you know, high level, how do people monetize their superpower? Get it out there. <laughs> that, that's the, uh, that's the fastest and easiest way. Put it out there. So I do teach you how to set your price. Um, I do teach you the power of creating a, a product funnel and the power of lead magnets and what a lead magnet is and how you can harness it. Uh, so it's really, really important that no matter what your product or service is, that you have an introductory or a no-brainer offer, uh, either something that's free that you give away as your lead magnet um, or something that is just ridiculously low price, that makes it no risk. People go, absolutely, no problem. Yeah, okay, $7, I'll take a chance. I'll try it once. That's how you get them to know, trust, and like you. That's how you get them to engage with you. So being a, I walk you through being able to break down your offerings to figure out what can you do that's that introductory and no-brainer offer. What can you do that's a low-ticket offer that kind of creates that, eh, sure, why not response. Uh, so they're paying a little bit more, but it's still a comfortable amount with no risk that they're willing to try you out. And then how do you create a mid-ticket offer? How do you create a high ticket offer and how do you create a, a more elite offer? Mm -hmm. um, how do you create recurring revenue through memberships or subscriptions? I walk you through all different types uh, of memberships and subscriptions that you can offer um, and how you can set those up. I talk about the power of harnessing and incentivizing your clients to buy more, more often and how to create win-win situations with that. So there are so many easy ways to monetize. Obviously, step one is to get something out there. You can't monetize if you don't launch. Uh, so by the time we get to chapter seven, like I said, you've already got, you know exactly what you're doing. You've already got your brand set up. You've already connected and built a tribe. So you've, you've got, uh, mentors and coaches and you've got a network of people that you can call upon to partner and affiliate and create you know referral systems and you're up and running with all of that and then you've already gone through gaining visibility maximizing engagement so by the time you're ready to monetize you have an army of people who are primed and ready to buy your offering that's exciting you know obviously the next chapter in this this is a no-brainer in the progression is now that I'm monetizing, how do I create sustainability or sustaining uh, or creating the staying power uh, of the brand I've created? So high level, what, what does that chapter really encompass? That is going to uh, be the chapter that teaches you how to continue to build momentum. It teaches you how to diversify, right? Because it's super important. You've got to be able to pivot, adapt, and diversify. You've got to be able to always meet changing needs. The needs are going to meet. Uh, are, are going to change. Um, it's why I went from just having the book to book, course, live uh, Zoom workshops, coaching, uh, the, the whole suite developed because needs changed. My clients that, you know, were on the front end of, of previewing the book then implemented that and said, hey, what else you got? How, how can we work with you? Uh, what other tips and tricks do you have? How can we get uh, live Q&A sessions? How can we continue training? How can we have accountability? How can we continue learning tricks to implement? And so I pivoted, I adapted, I created these other opportunities. So chapter eight is teaching you how to do the same thing um, so that you can always be responsive to the current needs of your clients uh, it's much cheaper and more effective to keep your clients and turn your existing clients into raving fans than it is to constantly be searching for new clients. So uh, I talk a lot about in chapter eight how to maximize and acknowledge and cultivate your existing clients while at the same time you're doing the things you need to do to grow your business. Yeah, I was going to say there's a there's a famous thing I heard one time: churn is burn. More. The more you churn customers, it burns a hole in your pocket. It burns through the revenue, and it's yeah. very, very expensive getting new customers for sure. So ultimately, what do you hope to accomplish by writing this book? Uh, this book, like I said, was a direct response to COVID. It was not, I had no intention of doing it um, before the pandemic, but I'm so grateful to see all the people that it's helping 
uh, so far. And so I just want, I want to continue to help people. I want people to be able to look at COVID as this opportunity that maybe, you know, maybe they've played it safe all these years. Maybe they followed the traditional route and they've done what was expected of them. And, you know, they went through life and they got their education and then they got the job and they've been at the same job for 20 years and, and now they've been laid off. And what an amazing opportunity that they have now to finally be able to create the, the life that they want, that they get to take control, they get to use what they know, do, and love, they get to shine their light into the world, they get to monetize their passions, they get to monetize their expertise. I was talking to one of my friends just yesterday and, and helping her um, diversify and pivot plan and uh, and she said to me something that you said earlier. She was like, uh, but I'm not really an expert. Like, why would anybody care? Like, what, what do I possibly have that could help people? And I said, do people ask you questions? And she said, yeah. I said, do people come to you for your opinion? Yeah. Okay, so why, why are they coming to you? Why do they ask you what you think about A, B, and C? Why, if they could have gone to their neighbor, but they came to you. So you have the answer that they're looking for and they value your take on the information or they wouldn't have come to you, they would ask somebody else. So each and every one of us, that's why I started with superpower, that's why I call it a superpower. Each and every one of us has something that we know, do and love better than somebody else, more efficient than someone else, faster than someone else, you know, I use the, the example in my book of um, meal prep services. I am a terrible cook. You do not want me in the kitchen. That is the one place you absolutely do not want to find me. If you find me in the kitchen, you should run. So could, yeah, it's, it's really bad. Uh, so could I learn how to cook? Sure. Could I follow a recipe? Sure. Is it effective for me to do that? E -e. Is it good use of my time? E -e. So I am so grateful that somebody else out there can cook and is selling it and is willing to put it in a little package and let me buy it and then deliver it to my door. I am so grateful for that. Or Taylor. Well, you want to pay a premium for that. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So it's these things, right? Those, those people who are developing the menus or cooking and making these meals, I guarantee you at first they were like, whatever, I just cook for my family, right? Like, doesn't everybody? And like then- Miss Fields cookies, up. right? Yeah, you know, like, I mean, it, it's, it's these things. Each and every one of us does something that we think is just normal, ordinary, everybody does it. But I guarantee you, like the ladies who made the masks, you know, like you can do, there are things that you can do better than I can. There are things you can do faster than I can. There are things you can do more effectively than I can. And I'm going to buy them from you. So there's a market is the point, right? There's always there's a market. There's always a market. Yeah. And you always have a solution. It's just figuring out what it is. So when's this book going to be available? It is coming out late July. So it is with the formatter right now. I'm super excited. Um, I should have the proof uh, next week. And then it'll be released on booksbyelly.com and also amazon.com. Awesome. And this will be end of July. It'll be available? End of July. It will be available. So be looking for it. Awesome. Well, that, that's exciting. It's a great book. Um, hats off to you for writing it because I think people need roadmaps and sort of directions. Uh, and more importantly, if you have the roadmap of how to do something, I remember early in my career, I learned to fly a plane out of Giant One Airport. Now, if you had told me when I first saw the plane, could I envision myself flying it and soloing it? No. But as I went through training and they provided roadmaps, guess what? My confidence grew, my understanding grew, and the fear perhaps of flying a plane went all away. So what you're doing is you're bringing in, you know, tools and, and, and sort of learnings and guidance and, and sort of roadmaps to really help people uh, monetize the, the greatest gifts. So uh, really hats off to you. I want to pivot here a little bit though um, and sort of go back to more of the personal side now. 
Um, what are some of the most important lessons you've learned in life? Because your, your, your story is so galvanizing. I mean, everything you've been through, the adversity, the setbacks, to have your attitude, your heart, and your spirit is really, really impressive. So from that, what are some of the most important lessons you've learned uh, through your experience? Change your story, change your life. The number one thing I live by. So, you know, beyond being, having been homeless and lived in my car, um, I'm an abuse survivor and a rape survivor, a domestic violence survivor. Um, I'm a medical miracle. I've had 13 major surgeries. I'm a cancer survivor. Um, I'm a former anorexic. I mean, the list goes on and on and on of, of things that I have uh, overcome in my life. And the two biggest, most important lifelines that I have carried with me always, the power of gratitude and change your meaning, change your life. And what that means is you cannot control what happens to you. You can't, life happens. But you can always control your thoughts about it. You can always control the story that you allow, that you tell yourself about the events. And you can always control the meanings that you ascribe to them. Mm. And you can let those events either be uh, a prison for you or they can be a powerful platform that you can use to let your mess be your message and your test be your testimonies. And it's a way that you can control the narrative. And it all goes back to mindset. And we talked about it earlier about the power of your mind and how critical it is. It is so incredibly, like there's nothing more critical than standing guard at the gate of your mind. It just is. It's the one thing that you can control that nobody can ever take away from you is your mindset and the stories you tell yourself, the thoughts you think and how you use those. And, and we have the power to turn our thoughts into empowering beliefs. We have the power to have our mindset push us toward greatness, push us towards freedom, push us towards the life that we want. And it's, it's amazing because it is the one thing that absolutely nobody else can take away from you. Right. Now, sort of like Viktor Frankl and Man's Search for Meaning, right? They couldn't take his thoughts away and his perspective towards Auschwitz and what he was going through. Yep. Yep. And uh, I, I think that's one of the best answers I've heard in this show. Thank you. That's, uh, you, you know, in addition to the book, you could do your own motivational series. That was uh, very great. So how has life been different than you'd imagined? I mean, you, you take, take us back to your eight-year-old self and that vision you had. How has your life been different? It, there's no part of it that's recognizable to the life that that eight-year-old envisioned. <laughs> the whole thing is different, right? It's a journey. Um, I couldn't have imagined in March that I have just finished my second book. I sent it off to the editor on Friday, actually. I am launching four global movements. Um, I, the first is, is this one, obviously it's resources to empower entrepreneurs. You mentioned mindset. I am developing a whole mindset platform called Creating an Impervious Mind. Um, because of my background with uh, abuse, rape, domestic violence, eating disorders, uh, cancer, all of that, I have developed You Are Not Your Stars, which it, uh, is a women's movement. It's resources to empower women to uh, create the life, a life on their terms. And then because I was that child who, from the hood, who's been homeless, um, because I've been involved in justice my entire life, um, because I couldn't have kids as a result of the health issues from the domestic violence and, and from cancer. Um, so I am really passionate about empowering the next generation. So I'm launching Made to Change the World, which is my youth platform to empower the next generation. So all of this came about from COVID. And, get, and that Zoom call where I got on there to help my friends be able to figure out what they were gonna do to eat, to pay their bills, to maintain uh, and to persevere. And from that, and that fundamental passion I have for de to developing and delivering practical, implementable, no-nonsense tools that people can use to empower themselves to create the life they want, whether that's entrepreneurs, women, mindset in general, 
or youth, all of that has come from COVID. Mm. So um, I live for, for just creating a, an authentic, empowered life that you're living present in the present, that you're focused, um, that's heart-centered, and growing and adapting. I mean, I couldn't have imagined this life four months ago, much less the eight or 10 year old. Like it, it, it just, I stay present, I stay focused, I stay congruent, I stay heart centered. Um, I stay focused on the fact that I'm here to serve and that that's my life's mission, that's my life's purpose. That's why I've walked through all the fires that I've walked through for almost 50 years. Um, it's how I change my meaning about those things and use that to change my life. I find the good in everything. I find the opportunity in everything and I find the opportunity to serve others and to show up powerfully in everything. Profound. Ellie, what advice would you give your younger self? Wow. Um, hold dear to know who you are, stand in your power, claim your voice. Don't let anyone take those things from you. Mm. And above all else, stand guard at the gate of your mind. Know who you are, know what you stand for, know what your values are, know what your ethics are, know what your dreams are and do not let anybody take them away from you. Best advice I've heard. That's absolutely spot on. So what you've accomplished so far, both personally and professionally, that, I guess, let me ask you a little differently. What have you accomplished thus far, both per, uh, professionally or, or personally that makes you the proudest and why? That I was made to change the world and that I'm doing it. Hmm. You know, I was going to say, you know, through this adversity of COVID, you have this, four, you have four different, you know, tracks you're working on that can profoundly change the world. And hopefully that doesn't mean we need more uh, COVIDs to create more, you know, more awesomeness, right? <laughs> Ho hopefully no. we can create some of this in just normal times. Uh, well, the good thing is, is now that they've taken off, um, like I said, I just finished my second book. The second book is launching the You Are Not Your Scars movement, the women's movement. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, uh, I'm developing all of the resources, the mindset resources for creating an impervious mind. Um, I am really blessed in that with everything that I've done in life, I do have a really powerful network um, that I have begun reaching out to to create all of the resources that I need for um, Made to Change the World. Made to Change the World will have several prongs. It will have a youth mindset. It will have youth empowerment. It will have youth entre entrepreneurship. Um, so I am building the network I need of entrepreneurs who can serve as mentors, building the network I need for that of real estate moguls who can uh, find and donate centers that we can use as hubs uh, all, all across the world um, for the youth to come and get the training and the mentorship and things like that. So uh, it's all in progress. Uh, I have, because I am still working, I do have two schools at the university to run. I am the, still the staff attorney to a federal judge. I have built an amazing team and I absolutely, there's only 24 hours in the day, no matter how efficient you are. So I could not do everything that I'm doing without them. Um, but they are just as passionate about creating impact. They are just uh, as passionate about allowing people to grab hold of these resources and impact not only their life, but their family's life, their neighborhoods, their community. It's a ripple effect. Um, and so all four movements will launch this year. I am committed to that. And um, I mean, the time is now, right? Yep. The, the time is now. We have, I could never have imagined when I started designing Made to Change the World, the protests that would be happening, the marches that would be organized by teenagers, the next generation who are driving voting uh, registration campaigns and reform police reform campaigns. These are, these are movements that are coming from the youth. And I had no way of knowing four months ago that this was going to be the time. But what an amazing 
time to be in to be able to harness my network, right? We talk about that in the book, but to be able to harness my network to, to give these youth the resources that they need to create the future that they want for themselves and to create the change that they're demanding. Right. That's good. Is there anything we haven't covered you'd like to share with the audience? You're awesome. Every single one of you out there is awesome. And you know what? Every day is a new opportunity. Every moment is a new opportunity. So if yesterday sucked, if you weren't feeling it yesterday, you have the opportunity today. And I challenge each and every one of you out there, wake up in the morning when your eyes open, start with gratitude. I don't care how bad your life is. You woke up that morning and open your eyes and say, good morning. What an amazing day. Oh, mm, thank you for that breath that I took. Thank you for the fact that I have a bed to sleep in or that there's a roof over my head. Train yourself to find the good because as much as is happening in the world right now, there is good and we just have to find it and we just have to train ourselves to see the good, to live in gratitude, to find the opportunity, to create the opportunity and to seize the opportunity. And that's something that we don't have to wait for someone to come in and save us. We don't need someone to do the reform. It starts with us and we, each and every one of you out there has that power. And when you take the first step, it's a domino effect. Yeah. It's training yourself. It, so knock down the first domino, open your eyes in the morning. Good morning. Today is an awesome day. Oh, thank you for my breath. Practice that throughout the day. You know, set a timer on your phone once an hour when it goes off. Think of something that you're grateful for. Reach out to someone that you know, help somebody else. Uh, one of the best ways to help ourselves is to serve. When we're focused on someone else, when we're focused on how we can help somebody or make somebody's day brighter or put a smile on their face or make somebody uh, feel seen or feel heard or feel recognized or feel not forgotten. There is such tremendous power in that. And when we get outside of ourselves, magic happens. I, can't, I don't think it could be said better. And, you know, as I'm listening to this, you're like a quadruple shot of life inspired espresso. So, so thank you so much for this time. Really enjoy getting to know you, your story, um, fired up about this book. And I hope that the audience will uh, go to your website to pick it up. Um, and, and I think this isn't a better time in the history of America to start looking at different options from a career perspective. You know, you could be soulless and lifeless in your current company. And this is an opportunity to you know, look afresh, a renewed, um, at what you could be doing in your life versus what you are doing. So Ellie, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. Grab the book at booksbyellie.com. Awesome. Thanks.